Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everybody. So good to see you. Thank you for putting your name into chat for me. Thank you very much. It's so good to see you. I've missed you. We had that terrible hiccup with Zoom last week, which by the way, is still going on. <laughs> it's the whole system. It's not just me. So I suppose that should make me feel a little bit better. But, uh, but yeah, the whole system at, uh, at River Valley for people who are trying to start Zoom meetings has been down. And you get this weird message that you're not authorized to start a Zoom meeting. So I spent a couple hours working on it on Wednesday and couldn't figure it out. And I finally got in touch with the IT people. And it turned out it wasn't just me, it was everybody. And the only thing they've been able to figure out so far is that it's related to Firefox. So sure enough, this morning, I just tried. I tried to come in on Firefox. And again, I got an unauthorized message. So I used Safari instead. So yes, we're terribly dependent upon all of this technology. And sometimes it just goes awry. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knows why, but I'm glad to be with you this morning. <clears throat> Today, we're going to be talking about an exciting topic called special media. Um, we're going to really start getting into some experimental work now. We're going to do some virtual experiments together um, from this point forward in the course so that um, so we learn a little more of the nuts and bolts of what goes on in a laboratory, a microbiology laboratory, in order to identify microbes. Um, what we've been talking about so far is more uh, general examining them, but now we'll start talking about the things that we do and the tools that we use in order to determine the identity of individual microbes that arrive in the lab. So before I jump into that, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our uh, to-do list for the week. Just to remind us about what's coming up. That's what you should be seeing on your screen right now is uh, the module in Canvas for week six. So this week, you technically have two topics in lecture, even though they're considered one. The topic is controlling microbial growth. And the way we break it down in this course is we talk first about the physical methods that we use to control the growth of microbes. So things like heat and uh, radiation, and things like that, uh, chemicals, disinfectants, and things like that. And then the other way we control the growth of microbes is with drugs. We use antimicrobial drugs to help control infections, particularly uh, bacterial infections, viral infections, and um, fungal infections, depending on the drug. So it's all sort of grouped together this week for us. You have one quiz to finish on, those, uh, on that big topic. The other thing I wanna point out is this. I've put together a table for you, a one page table that compares the four big families of chemical disinfectants. There are four actual families of these. There are the alcohols, there are the chlorinated compounds, though that's what bleach belongs to. There's a group called iodophores. And the last group is the quaternary ammonium compounds. 
And these four families have advantages to their use and disadvantages to their use. And they all work by different mechanisms. So all of that information I have summarized for you in this one page table. So it's much easier to study, I think, um, and prepare for the next exam. Now, the exam, the next exam, lecture exam three comes up um, this week. It opens up as usual on Thursday morning at eight o'clock and it is due by Saturday at midnight. No changes in terms of what the exam looks like. There are a couple more questions on this exam than on past exams. I believe there's 30 questions on this one and two bonus questions. So um, just, just so you're aware, but no big changes in terms of length. Um, that table that I posted for you about the chemical disinfectants, I'll tell you that there's a bonus question about that table. So um, in terms of your studying time and, and how much attention to put on that table, um, know that there's a bonus question on it. So um, don't give it tons and tons of time um, in order to memorize it. Just, um, just give it enough time so you can um, try that bonus question. Um, in laboratory this week, like I said, we're doing special media today. And then on Wednesday, when we get together, we're gonna to talk about oxygen. We're gonna talk about the role of oxygen and uh, in the growth of microbes and how they differ from species to species in terms of their requirements for oxygen. And that'll be coming up on Wednesday. And of course you have laboratory questions to answer for me um, by the end of the week. So before I jump into the slides for today, let me ask if anybody has any questions about last week's material, either the laboratory material or the lecture material from last week. You did have a challenging, I think a challenging lecture last week about biochemistry. Um, I was very happy to see that um, everybody did quite well on that quiz. I think that biochemistry material is very challenging, um, especially if you haven't been introduced to that before. Um, we also remember we, we had some uh, laboratory material that I posted as video for you. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to type that into chat for me, okay? And as always, you can, you can also contact me privately. You can message me privately if you have questions. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and open up our slides and we can get started. That's what you should be seeing on your screen right now. The title slide says special media. So we've been talking about culture media through the whole summer so far. We've been talking about different kinds of culture media. And today we're gonna to focus in on one particular sort of category of culture media, which we refer to as the special media. Our objectives today are first to define six different culture media categories. We've already talked about a couple of these, but today we will outline that there are six different groups of culture media that we use in the microbiology lab. We will talk specifically and in detail about selective culture media and differential culture media. Those two are what we call the special media. And then we'll have a virtual experiment together. We're gonna to compare the growth of a group of microbes on two kinds of special media. One is called mannitol salts agar and we shorthand that as MSA. And the other type is called eosin methylene blue agar. And we shorthand that EMB. We love to use abbreviations in microbiology if you haven't picked up on that already. But let's begin by talking 
in a little more detail than we have about types of culture media. Remember, in the microbiology lab, the culture media that we use can be solid. That's the auger that we use. It can be semi-solid. We'll talk about that type more on Wednesday. And it can also be a liquid or what we call a broth. Now we start off those kinds of media just blank, like an empty canvas. And we add ingredients, basically. We add ingredients to water in order to create a broth. And we add ingredients to auger in order to create a solid media. We can turn any broth into a solid media just by adding plain auger to it. We can do that if we want. And we can turn most augers back into broths by removing auger from the recipe. So we have a lot of uh, freedom when we make up culture media in the laboratory. Now, from last time, if you remember, we talked about the difference between what we call a chemically defined medium and a complex medium. We said that any time that we are putting together a medium that has a list of known ingredients, we refer to that as chemically defined. In other words, we know each and every chemical that goes into that media. Now, in comparison, a complex culture media has some ingredients in it that are complex in their chemistry. Things like blood and egg and meat, things like that. I used a couple of words in the video that I made for you last week that we're gonna look at again today. This word fastidious is important when we talk about complex media versus chemically defined media. Most bacteria are happy to grow on a chemically defined medium because most bacteria are able to survive as long as they have a certain short list of ingredients. They always need water. They always need carbohydrate because that's what they use to make their ATP. They always need some kind of carbon source and that's usually some type of protein. And then they have a certain list of vitamins and minerals that they need, but really that's about it. Now there are some organisms though that don't grow well on chemically defined media and we give them a name, we call them fastidious. And all that word fastidious means is hard to grow. They're hard to grow because they have some kind of very specific nutritional requirement. And in order to meet those nutritional requirements, we add in one of these natural complex ingredients like blood, like egg, like milk, like meat. These types of ingredients, especially things like milk and egg are extremely complex nutritionally. If you think about it, milk, helps keep a baby animal alive for the first months and even year of their lives. So it's a nutritionally very complete food. Egg is the same. Egg has to support the development of uh, an organism until, uh, in, in, case, in the case of birds, until they hatch. So it's a nutritionally very complete food. When we add these complex ingredients into culture media, we usually meet the requirements of these fastidious organisms. Now I've said before, and you'll hear me say it a lot this summer, there are lots of types of media that you can use in the microbiology lab, and each one has its own specific type of recipe. 
these are usually available commercially. So you buy them in a dried, uh, a powdered form, and then you reconstitute them in the laboratory. If you wanna make a broth, you reconstitute them with water. If you wanna make a solid media, you put in water and auger because the auger is gonna be what solidifies the media. Some of these media, in fact, a lot of these media will allow virtually any kind of microbe to grow on them. That's why we have to be so careful not to contaminate our culture containers because what we've created in culture media is this nutritional paradise, basically. So yeah, we want our chosen bacteria to grow, but if a fungus accidentally got in there or some other kind of bacteria got in there, that thing is gonna be happy to grow as well. Now, we do have specialized media to grow organisms other than bacteria. Remember, we have a type of media that's specific for fungus. That's the type of media called sabarodes that we talked about in lab last week. Some allow only non-fastidious microbes to grow. Those are the kind that are easy to grow because they have simple nutritional requirements and others will support the growth of fastidious organisms. Those organisms that have very particular nutritional requirements. Here's something new on this next bullet point. We also have media that are designed to encourage or support the growth of some microbes while inhibiting the growth of others. And some of those media, some of those media actually change color when certain microbes that grow on them release particular metabolic products. Now that color change that we sometimes see is the result of adding in an indicator dye into the media. So we have the ability using these very special culture media, we have the ability to be able to look at the culture container and know whether or not this particular bacterium has a particular metabolic activity going on. And the reason we know that is because the media changes color. If a particular microbe is capable of performing a certain type of metabolism, they're gonna create a byproduct, a metabolic byproduct. And that byproduct, when it's present, is gonna cause those indicator dyes to change color. So all we have to do is look. All we have to do is look at the broth or look at the plate. And if we see a color change occurring, we can say, oh, okay, well, I know this bacterium is doing this metabolically. Now, if you recall from chemistry, an indicator dye is a dye that changes color because the pH changes. So that's what's happening really. If the microbe is performing a certain metabolic pathway, and creating this metabolic byproduct, that byproduct is causing a shift in the pH of the media. And that pH change is what makes that dye change color. It's very, very handy for us in the microbiology lab because it again, helps us differentiate some very closely related species of bacteria based on whether or not they can perform a particular metabolic reaction. Remember this word metabolism is nothing uh, complicated. When I say metabolic, I'm talking just about chemical, chemical reactions. The chemical reactions that all living things perform in order to survive every day. So you and I have a certain set of metabolic reactions or chemical reactions that our cells perform every day in order to keep us alive. 
that's your metabolism. Your metabolism is your set of reactions. And each different species and each different strain of each species can have differences in which chemical reactions they perform every day. And by identifying those, we can help identify the species. All right. So let's list those six, six types of culture media. Now we've already talked about two of them. We called it chemically defined media and complex media. Another way to say chemically defined is basal. So if you hear somebody or me or a textbook talk about basal media, what they're talking about is a medium that is chemically defined. It has a short list usually of known ingredients and it will support the growth of most non-fastidious bacteria chemically defined. So nutrient auger and nutrient broth, which I tend to use a lot in our experiments, that's a basal media. There's one called peptone water. That's another basal media. In fact, there are lots of basal media. We use them every day in the microbiology lab to try to purposefully grow bacteria. Now, in terms of those complex media, the other term we use is enriched. So whether you hear the word complex or the word enriched, I want you to think about media that have these other ingredients added in, things like blood and serum and milk and egg yolk and so on. These are the media that we use when we're trying to grow fastidious organisms. I've listed just a couple of them down here. There's a common one called Luria Britanni broth or LB. There's one called blood auger. There's one called chocolate auger. Now, before you get excited that we put chocolate into auger, <laughs> we actually don't. <laughs> All chocolate auger is, is blood auger that has cooked blood in it. Yeah, when you look at chocolate auger, and I'll show you a picture of it, you can see why we call it chocolate auger. It looks like chocolate. But what it is, is auger that has blood in it as its complex ingredient. And what all we did was we cooked that blood before we put it in. You know, when you cook something, a natural product, oftentimes what you're doing is you're making it easier to get the nutrients out of it. So think about the difference between, for example, a raw uh, chicken breast and a cooked chicken breast. The truth is that the cooked chicken breast is gonna be easier to pull apart. It's gonna be easier to cut up into pieces. It's also gonna be easier to chew and it's gonna be easier to digest because it's cooked because the heat that was applied to it broke down some of the bonds in that meat and just makes it easier to digest. So sometimes we will take an ingredient like blood and we'll cook it. If we think we have an organism that needs just that little bit of extra help getting at the ingredients that it needs in order to grow. Um, sometimes I have students ask me, where does the blood come from <laughs> that we use? Um, it's usually sheep blood. It's usually the blood that comes from sheep uh, for no particular reason. I mean, you could certainly put cow blood or something like that in too. You could put any kind of blood in. Blood is a very rich nutritional substance. Um, it just so happens that most of the chemical supply houses that make microbiology media, they tend to use sheep blood in their recipe. So basal media and enriched media are the first two categories. Basal, which is just 
the same thing as chemically defined and enriched, which is the same thing as complex. Remember, there's a big difference when we look at these media in the liquid or broth form and as auger. A lot of the broth formulations look exactly the same. They have this sort of a beige color, a yellowy kind of beige color. Um, a lot of broth looks just like this, even though the recipes differ. Now, I just wanna remind us of one thing, one important thing that we remember in the lab, which is broth is always clear. It's always transparent before we inoculate it. Once bacteria start growing in a broth tube, the media is gonna start getting cloudy like this one over here on the left. That's how you know when you pull a broth tube out of the incubator, that's how you know if you've been successful. If you've grown bacteria in there, it's gonna start looking cloudy like this one versus this one, which is uninoculated. It hasn't had any cells put in it yet. Now over here on the right, just, just so you can see this media, this is an auger plate that has blood auger on it, this red plate. I think it's pretty obvious that you can see the effect that the blood has on the auger. It has this um, deep red color associated with it. Down below, this is what chocolate auger looks like. So you can see why. You can see why we refer to it as chocolate auger. It just has that look. It has that same brownish color that um, chocolate has. And the only difference between these two, these two are both, both enriched culture media. And they've been enriched with blood. This one has what we'll call raw blood in it. And this one has cooked blood in it. And we would use those media if we were trying to grow organisms that are fastidious, a little harder to grow. Now, this is probably an obvious point to make, but I'll make it anyway. <laughs> a non-fastidious bacterium, one that's easy to grow, that one will grow on blood auger, sure. Non-fastidious bacteria can grow on anything, really. They can grow on basal media, and they can grow on enriched media. They're non-fastidious. They don't have a lot of nutritional requirements that are particularly specific. So they can grow on both types. But fastidious bacteria, they require enriched media. They require that complex media or they're not gonna grow for you. All right. Now let's talk about these special media. The third type of culture media is called selective media. And all selective media is, is a type of culture media that is gonna allow the growth of desired bacteria while it inhibits the growth of unwanted bacteria. So this is a type of media that selects which kind of bacteria can grow on it and which kind can't. Selective media is typically an auger as opposed to a broth, but don't worry about that small detail. Selective media is extremely helpful in the laboratory. You can imagine that if we're dealing with a real world sample, so think about those environmental samples that we talked about, water samples, samples that come out of um, buildings, hospitals, doctor's offices, uh, ventilation shafts and office buildings, real world samples. Those samples are often mixed with different types of bacteria, right? because they came out of the real world. Let's say that we are looking for a particular kind of bacteria though. Let's say that what we're interested in, in that swimming area at the lake, what we really wanna know 
is whether or not there's any E. coli growing because E. coli can be a pathogen in humans. What we're gonna want to put that water sample on is a kind of media that will encourage E. coli to grow, but it will also inhibit other kinds of bacteria from growing. Does that make sense? We're gonna grow it on a medium that selects for this bacteria if it's present. It's going to encourage the growth of certain kinds of bacteria while inhibiting the growth of other kinds of bacteria, just to make our job easier. Rather than grow everything that's in that water, we're just curious if there's this pathogen in that water. That's what selective media is used for. I see your message, Elizabeth, no problem at all. Now, one of the media, one of the uh, common selective media is that one called mannitol salt auger or MSA. This is the one I mentioned at the beginning of lab today. Now, what makes MSA selective is this uh, ingredient salt. Now, it has a particular kind of salt in it. It has sodium chloride in it. And it has a lot of sodium chloride in it. You can actually buy or make MSA in two concentrations of salt. You can make it with seven and a half percent sodium chloride, or you can make it with 10% sodium chloride. Now, this kind of media, mannitol salt auger, selects for Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus species. That's what the SPP stands for. It's especially useful for growing Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis. And we'll talk a little bit more about those organisms in a minute. Remember, all selective media are gonna select for some kind of bacteria and select against other kinds of bacteria. So this one selects for Staphylococcus, and it, is, it selects against pretty much every other kind of bacteria. There is an exception. There is an exception, but it's a small one. There's a type of bacteria called enterococcus. These are um, cocci that tend to grow in the gastrointestinal tract. That's what that term entero means. It means GI, gastrointestinal. So this is a caucus that lives in the GI tract. There's another kind called micrococcus. This is another kind of uh, cocci. These two organisms sometimes will grow on MSA. But if they do grow, they grow really poorly. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that if an enterococcus or a micrococcus grows, it's gonna grow as little tiny colonies, even after 24 hours, you're gonna get little tiny colonies and you're not gonna get very many of them. That's really the only exception to the rule. All other bacteria, other than Staphylococcus, they can't deal with that much salt. They can't manage to be in an environment with that much sodium chloride in it. And so they can't grow, they die. But for some evolutionary reason, Staphylococcus loves salt. Staphylococcus doesn't mind salt at all. So now we have a medium, mannitol salt auger, that we can use if we think we've got a Staphylococcus. We think we've got one, we wanna make sure, and we don't wanna deal with a lot of other bacteria growing and confusing our results. We'd like to just see if there's a Staphylococcus present in some mix of bacteria. Now up here on the left, this is what mannitol salt auger looks like before it's inoculated. It's a, it has this pinkish color. 
it's a, a, a light sort of a pinkish color to the auger. Now, there are many other kinds of selective media. Mannitol salt auger is just one. There's many, many other types of selective media and you use the one that's appropriate to your needs. So that's selective media. Now let's talk about the next type, which is differential media. Now a differential media, like the name suggests, can help us differentiate between strains of bacteria that are closely related to each other. And again, differential media is the kind that has this dye in it, this indicator dye, and it will change color if a certain metabolic product is produced. So selective media selects for some types of bacteria and against other types. Differential media can help us differentiate between two or more closely related bacteria, what we would call strains of bacteria. Do you remember what that word strain means in microbiology? We talked about how all microbes have a genus and a species, all organisms, in fact, all living organisms have a genus and a species. There are also strains within a species. And all a strain is, is a version of a species that has its own characteristics. And I always tell students that think of strains of bacteria the way you think of breeds of dogs. Obviously a Chihuahua and a Great Dane and an Irish Setter, they're all dogs. They all belong to the same species, but they're different enough from each other that we think of them as different dogs. They're all dogs, they're all the same species, but a Chihuahua and a Great Dane and an Irish Setter sure look different and behave different. There are also breeds or strains of bacteria. They're all the same species, but they have their own unique set of traits. So we call them different strains. Differential media helps us differentiate sometimes among species and sometimes among those strains. It helps us tell the difference between closely related organisms. One type of differential media that's quite commonly used is called McConkie auger. Now McConkie is a media that is both selective and differential. There are lots of media like that. There are lots of media that are both selective media and differential media. McConkie is selective because it selects for gram negative enteric bacteria. Again, that term enteric refers to the gastrointestinal system. So gram negative organisms that live in the gut. It selects for those organisms and it will select against other types of bacteria. So gram positive bacteria can't grow on McConkie agar. Now, it's a differential media because it can differentiate between organisms that can ferment lactose and organisms that can't. Here's why it works. Any bacteria that can ferment lactose is gonna make an acidic byproduct from the lactose. That's gonna change the pH of the media and it's gonna cause the bacterial colonies to turn pink. And it's quite striking when you see it. Any bacteria that can't ferment lactose, they're gonna leave the pH of the media neutral because they're not making any acid byproducts. 
And what will happen is those colonies will grow with the typical pale sort of white or colorless look to them. So McConkie is selective and differential. It's going to select for gram negative enteric bacteria. And among those, among all of the gram negative enteric bacteria, it'll help us tell the difference between the ones that can ferment lactose and the ones that can't. And we'll be able to tell the difference just by looking at the plate. That's what makes differential media so nice. You can just look. If you see pink colonies growing on McConkie agar, you know a couple things. You know that that bacteria is gram negative and you know that it's an enteric bacteria, that it's an intestinal bacterium. We know that because other types of bacteria can't grow on McConkie's. And if the colonies are pink, it tells us that this particular gram negative enteric bacteria can also ferment lactose. It's very, very helpful to use selective and differential media when you're trying to identify bacteria, when you're trying to isolate and identify particular species of bacteria. I'll give you one more example, and that's this blood auger that we were talking about. This is an enriched media or a complex media because it has blood in it. Lots of different bacteria will grow on blood auger. Fastidious and non-fastidious will grow on blood auger, but it, it's differential because it helps us identify certain kinds of streptococcus that are particularly pathogenic. There are some species of streptococcus that can produce an enzyme called homolysin. Homolysin is an enzyme that can hemolyze or break apart blood vessels. Sorry, blood cells, not blood vessels. So if you get a streptococcus infection and that streptococcus makes this homolysin enzyme, it can actually destroy red blood cells. It can actually break down red blood cells. And you can imagine that would be quite dangerous, that kind of an infection. What you see on the auger when you have one of those types of strep is the colony will be growing on the red auger, but there'll be a clear zone all the way around it. In other words, as the colony of strep grows, it secretes that hemolysin and it literally breaks apart the blood in the area around it. So you get a clear zone on the auger. And that tells you right away that you've got a streptococcus here that's capable of making hemolysin. That's a dangerous organism, that's a pathogen. So blood auger is differential it's also enriched or complex because it has blood in it. Now, these are just examples of differential media. There are lots and lots of differential media. And remember I said a lot of special media is both selective and differential including the two types that we're going to use today in our virtual experiment. So if we go through the list, so far we have basal media, that's chemically defined. We have enriched media, that's the one that's complex. We have selective media, we have differential media, and there are two more. There's transport media and there's storage media. We talked a little bit about transport media when we were talking about taking environmental samples. All transport media is, is a medium that's gonna give enough nutrition 
to allow any microbial cells to survive while they're being transported to the lab. Now, it's really important to understand that transport media is a very basic media. It's a basal media too, in the sense that it has a known list of ingredients in it, but these ingredients are not designed to encourage that microbe to grow and divide. It's enough nutrition to keep it alive, but not enough to encourage it to grow. If you think about it, we don't want to give that bacterium any ability to grow on the way to the lab because we need to know that that transport media is helping us get a swab, for example, from the emergency room to the lab. What we wanna know is what's growing on that swab and about how much there is. What we don't want to happen on the way to the lab is that it grows and grows and grows and grows because that's gonna give us a false idea of how much bacteria there was on that swab. We just wanna keep it alive. We wanna keep it alive until we get it to the lab. And remember, remember, you've got about 24 hours before those cells are gonna to start to die. You got about 24 hours with transport media to get that sample to the lab. So the clock is ticking. The last kind of culture media on our list of six is storage media. Storage media is actually kind of interesting. Storage media has a, an ingredient in it called glycerol. And what glycerol does is it protects microbial cells and allows them to be frozen for a while. A lot of times when we are growing bacteria in a microbiology lab, especially if it's a research laboratory, a lot of times we're gonna have certain types of bacteria that we wanna keep. We wanna keep and be able to use later on. So in order to keep them over the long term, what we do is we put them into this storage media and then we freeze them and we deep freeze them. We put them into a minus 20 or even a minus 80 Celsius freezer. And in order to do that and be able to use those cells later, you have to protect them from the effects of freezing. Remember, it's not the process of freezing that kills cells, it's the process of thawing that kills cells. Remember from chemistry, Water has a very unusual trait in that when water freezes, it expands. So when you take a cell that's full of water, as all cells are, and you freeze it, all the water inside in the cytoplasm is gonna expand. And that's gonna ruin the membrane, essentially. It's gonna just tear at the membrane. Now that cell is still technically alive, frozen, but when you go to thaw that cell, that cell's not gonna survive. That water's gonna then shrink back down and that membrane, which has been stretched and torn and damaged, it, it's not gonna be able to support the life of the cell. So yeah, it's really hard to keep something alive if you freeze it. You can keep it in a sort of a suspended animation for a while, but as soon as you thaw it, you've lost it. It's gonna die. So in order to get past that, you have to add something in that's cryoprotective, that's protective against the effects of freezing. And the ingredient that's used for microbes is glycerol. When you put the glycerol in to storage media, what it does when you put the cells in is it forces the water out of the cell. So the water in the cytoplasm gets replaced with glycerol. And it's okay temporarily because that cell is frozen. So it's not metabolically active. Then when you wanna thaw it, you don't have that problem with expansion. 
you simply put the cells back into water and the glycerol will be replaced with water. So it's a way to keep cells alive through the process of freezing and thawing. And uh, we use it a lot in the micro lab because we often have samples that we wanna keep. And the only way to keep them for the long term, in other words, months and years, is to freeze them. And we use storage media so that we'll keep them alive. All right, does anybody have any questions about the types of storage media? Any questions about any of these six types? Basal, enriched, selective, differential, transport, and storage. All right, very good. This is a good point for us to take a quick break. I will see you back at 10 o'clock. Go get yourself a cup of coffee and we'll see you back in a few minutes.
Okay, yes. As you're coming back in, please go ahead and type your name into chat for me. I know some of you are um, experiencing some weather right now. <laughs> Hopefully we won't lose you. But remember, if you do get booted off during a weather event or something, and you can't get back on, you can always watch the lab later, whatever part you missed. Very good. Yeah, just type your first name for me or your nickname for me right into that chat so that I have um, all my attendance. Yes, Lisa, we do need the rain. Oh my gosh, it got so hot this weekend. Um, I didn't realize from Friday to Saturday, it just got so hot. And my poor plants were like, hey, what happened? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> Yeah, we, we can use the rain. We can always use the rain, so. We've had a kind of a strange summer though. It's been very mild. And then we get these stretches of very hot weather. They had ice and snow on Mount Washington a, a few days ago. And yeah. then it's like a hundred degrees from 20 degrees, it's insane. It is, it's insane. It's so strange. And the, the parts of the country now like you get whole you know a third or a half of the country now experiencing the same type of weather you know that never used to happen i'm grateful that we live in a part of the country where it doesn't get hot for you know three weeks at a time you know there are folks down in the south that are experiencing 100 plus weather day after day after day after day after day i i don't know how you do that i guess you stay inside I guess you stay inside. I don't know. All right. So it's just 10 o'clock. If you haven't yet, go ahead and type your name into chat for me. I will mention before we get started again that if you haven't had a chance to go click on the discussion boards lately, there is a new discussion board that I put up for us about microbiology in the news. Um, there's always microbiology in the news. If it's not a story about a recall of a food product, um, it's a story about a contaminated lake, or it's a story about um, the COVID-19 pandemic, or um, most recently, the increasing number of cases of monkeypox that are going on in our country. Um, I did make a post about the monkeypox outbreak, um, if you're interested, if you're interested in reading a little bit about it. And remember on these discussion boards, you're free to reply and ask questions or give your thoughts and opinions. Um, this is a way for us to learn even more than what's on our syllabus while we're taking the class. All right, so what we're gonna do now is have our virtual experiment. Um, and I'm gonna jump right back in and go back to our slides. So when we have these virtual experiments and we'll have one most days now from this point forward, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the organisms that we're going to use in our experiment, or the bugs, as I like to call them. We're going to be using four types of bacteria today. We're going to be using Escherichia coli. That's the one that most people refer to as E. coli. We're going to use an organism called Enterococcus faecalis, one called Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus aureus. Now let's take a look at these organisms and learn a little about them. E. coli is a gram-negative rod, and this is an enteric organism. This is an organism that lives in the gut. You'll also hear it referred to as a fecal organism, and that's because E. coli is passed out of humans and other animals' guts in the feces. 
and it's passed out as a living organism. So it's a source of contamination, this fecal material. Now, Enterococcus faecalis is a gram-positive coccus, as the name suggests to us. It's a coccus, but uh, it's also an enteric fecal organism, just like E. coli is. Now, you'll sometimes hear Enterococcus called fecal streptococcus. Now, I don't know why that, that, um, that started, but people refer to it as a streptococcus that lives in the feces. <laughs> but it is an actually different genus. It's an enterococcus, not streptococcus. So these two organisms, they have where they live in common, but they are different types of organisms in terms of their gram status. Third on the list is Staphylococcus epidermidis. This is another gram-positive coccus. This organism lives on the skin of humans and other animals. And finally, there's Staphylococcus aureus, gram-positive coccus, can be found on the skin, can be found in the nose, and in the back of the throat or the pharynx. Now, I'm gonna make an important point here. Make sure you put this into your notes. When I talk about an organism living on us or in us, remember that sometimes you'll get strains of those organisms that are non-pathogenic and are just part of your microbiome. Sometimes you'll find strains that are pathogens. So in other words, an organism like E. coli is found in the human body normally. It's part of your normal microbiome. And those are strains of E. coli that are not harmful to you. In fact, they're helpful to you. They help keep you as a strong, healthy person, and they keep your gut healthy. It is possible, though, for you to encounter and, and take in a pathogenic strain of E. coli. And that one would make you sick. So it's important to remember that there are some organisms that it depends. It, sometimes it's a perfectly harmless version and sometimes it's a dangerous version, even though it's the same species. Staphylococcus epidermidis lives on us, again, part of our microbiome, but also has certain strains that are pathogenic. Staph aureus is even more likely to be pathogenic, but about 25% of us have staph aureus as part of our microbiome. It's just part of us. About 25% of us carry staph aureus on our skin and up our nose and in the back of our throats, and it doesn't make us sick. But for most of the rest of us, Staph aureus tends to be a pathogen on us. So you always have to keep in mind that you don't know right away, just by the name of an organism, at least for most of them, whether or not you're talking about a harmless organism or a pathogen. It depends on the strain. So we have four bacteria that I've chosen here. And here's our experiment. I'm going to choose, or I did choose, two of these organisms, and I mixed them together into a single culture. So we have a fifth culture tube, in other words, that has an unknown mix of two of these organisms. And our experimental goal is to use culture media to help figure out which two I put in. We're going to use special media to do this. And we're gonna see if we can figure out which two of these organisms I put in. Now, here's a quick question for you. Take a look at these four organisms and the information I've provided about them. Could we just do some gram staining? Could I take the mixed unknown culture and do a gram stain on it? 
would that tell me which two organisms were in there? What do you think? Gram staining, if you remember, I told you was the first test we do in the laboratory. We always gram stain. If I took that tube that has an unknown mix of two organisms in it, and I did a gram stain on it, would that help me tell? Brooke says no, Sarah says no. What do you think? Lisa says it would help a little, but you can't tell the gram positives apart. Good. Do you see what I'm asking here? I know that inside my unknown culture tube, there are two bacteria. And I know that those two come from those four that I listed. Uh, two of them are in the tube. I don't know which two, but two of them are in there. So if I gram stained that tube, I could get a little information, but I wouldn't be able to know for sure which two organisms I had. Let's take a look. If I saw a gram negative rod on my smear, I would know it was E. coli because there are no other gram negatives here. See that? So if I saw a gram negative rod on my smear, I'd say, yay, I know one of them is E. coli, <clears throat> but the other one is gonna show up as a gram positive caucus. And I'm gonna have no way to know which one it is. So gram staining can be very helpful. Absolutely. It gives us a piece of information, even in an experiment like this one, it would tell me whether or not E. coli was in there because E. coli is the only gram negative organism on my list. So if I saw a gram negative in there, I would know that's gotta be E. coli, but gram positives would tell me nothing. If I saw a gram positive caucus, it could be enterococcus, it could be staph epidermidis, or it could be staph aureus. I wouldn't know. Does that make sense? Or should I say, does that not make sense to anyone? I know what the four possibilities are and I know two of them are in my mystery tube. My job is to figure out which two. I could certainly do the gram stain, but it would be really depressing if I did the gram stain and it was all gram positive cocci. That would be really depressing. <laughs> It would give me a little information though, just a little. All right, so for our media today, we're gonna to use three. We're gonna use nutrient agar. Remember that's a basal media. We're gonna use mannitol salt agar at a strength of 7.5%. And the third media we're going to use is eosin methylene blue or EMB. All right. Nutrient agar, that's just a basal media. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all four of our possible organisms onto this basal media. Mannitol salt agar is a selective and differential media. I'm gonna put my mystery tube organisms onto that one. And I'm gonna put my mystery tube organisms onto EMB. Mannitol salt, remember, is selective for staphylococcus. And I have two kinds of staphylococcus as possibilities, right? I have staph aureus and staph epidermidis. The nice thing about MSA is it selects against virtually all other bacteria. But remember our little caveat that I mentioned, sometimes enterococcus can grow weakly on MSA. So I have an enterococcus organism today, so I'll have to be aware of that. 
Now, mannitol salt is also differential. And what it does, what we do in terms of differentiating is it will help differentiate mannitol fermenters from mannitol non-fermenters. Remember the name of the media, mannitol salt agar. The salt is what makes it selective. It's gonna select for staphylococcus. So if anything grows on that plate, I know it's a staphylococcus. It's also differential though, and it differentiates between organisms that can ferment mannitol, that's just a sugar, and organisms that can't. All right, let's take a look. Staph aureus, Staphylococcus aureus, is a mannitol fermenter. Staphylococcus epidermidis is a non-fermenter. When mannitol fermenters grow on MSA, they use this sugar, this mannitol, they ferment it and they produce an acid. The indicator dye in the agar then turns yellow. Remember, mannitol salt agar starts off as this light pink color. So if a mannitol fermenter grows on this agar, the agar is gonna turn yellow where the colonies are. Not the colonies, by the way, the, the media is gonna turn yellow. If a non-fermenter grows, the agar will stay pink. So we have two kinds of Staphylococcus as possibilities today. We have Staphylococcus epidermidis and we have Staphylococcus aureus. We know that staph, both kinds of Staph will grow on MSA. We'll be able to tell which one we have, if we have one. We'll be able to tell by whether or not the media stays pink or turns yellow. If it stays pink, we know we have S. epidermidis. If it turns yellow, we know we have S. aureus. Take a look at this slide. Over on the left, this is what mannitol salt agar looks like before it's inoculated. You can really see it's got this nice light pink color to it. Now over here on the right, this is a plate that was streaked with two kinds of staphylococcus. Up at the top, you can just see the streak marks and the growth that's occurring on those streak marks. This, was, this half of the plate was streaked with staph epidermidis. And down at the bottom, you can see these streak marks. This was staph aureus. So on this plate, this organism grew. You can see that there's growth on the streak lines. It grew and it turned the plate yellow. This is Staph aureus. This is a classic result for Staph aureus. The mannitol sugar inside the medium was fermented by the Staph aureus. And that created an acid which changed the pH and turned the media yellow. Up at the top, we have something growing up here, but the media stayed pink. That tells you that the mannitol was not fermented by this organism. It was not able to ferment the sugar in the media. It, it could grow, it could survive, but it wasn't able to ferment the mannitol and the media stayed pink. And this is classic for staph epidermidis. Does that make sense to everybody? This is a selective and differential media. It selects for staphylococcus. So if something grows on it in our experiment, we know it's a staphylococcus. It also differentiates between the staphylococcus that can ferment mannitol and the staphylococcus that can't. 
If they can ferment it, the media will turn yellow. If they can't, the media will stay pink. Staph aureus is a mannitol fermenter. Staph epidermidis isn't. So we should be able to look at that plate and know if we have any staph in our mystery culture and which staff it is. Now, the other media we'll be using today is eosin methylene blue or EMB. This one is also selective and differential. EMB is a little more complex though. It is selective for gram negatives, particularly E. coli and other fecal coliforms. And it will allow fecal non-coliforms to grow as well. All right, so what does this word coliform mean? When you hear the word coliform, that means an organism that's able to ferment lactose and or the sugar called sucrose. So a lot of the organisms that live in our gut are coliforms. And all that means is, again, they can ferment lactose and or the sugar called sucrose. So what can grow on EMB is a lot of fecal organisms. What cannot grow on EMB are any gram positive organisms. So things like Enterococcus faecalis, remember that one is sometimes called a fecal streptococcus, that cannot grow on EMB. Any gram positive organism will be selected against and will not grow. Now, EMB is differential. It's gonna help us differentiate between E. coli, other fecal coliforms, and non-coliforms. It's gonna help us differentiate all these fecal gram negatives. If the organism is a lactose fermenter, it will grow as a purple colony. If it grows as a purple colony and it has a green metallic sheen to it, it's E. coli. So this is a media that just by looking at it, looking at what grows on it, we can know specifically the genus and species we're looking at. That's useful. If E. coli, or I should say when E. coli grows on EMB, the colonies will be purple and they will have a green metallic looking sheen on them. And I'm gonna show you a picture of this. Only E. coli does that. E. coli is a coliform. It's a gram negative fecal coliform. It can ferment lactose and or sucrose. So if it grows as a purple colony with a green color on it, we know it's E. coli. Other gram negative fecal coliforms will grow as a purple colony, but they won't have that green metallic color. So any other fecal gram negative coliform will grow as a purple colony, but it won't have the green color. Now remember, we can also grow other kinds of gram-negative fecal organisms on EMB. Other gram-negative non-fermenters. So organisms like, for example, Salmonella, that's an enteric organism. There's one called Shigella. These are bacteria that live in your gut. They're gram-negative but they're not coliforms. They're not able to ferment lactose and sucrose. They'll grow on EMB, but they won't be purple colonies. They'll be colorless colonies. So we can get a lot of information out of an EMB plate. 
There's one other thing listed here, and I'm gonna tell you just to be complete. When a coliform grows on EMB, remember it's gonna be purple. The colony is gonna be purple. Sometimes there'll be a dot in the middle of it. So sometimes you'll see a purple colony with a black dot in the middle. That's referred to as a fisheye colony. It doesn't mean anything special on EMB. It just gives you some more information about the type of gram negative fecal organism you're dealing with. So let's take a look. On the upper left hand side here, this is what an EMB plate looks like before it's inoculated. Look at that color. It's almost like, um, like a grape juice color. It's a deep reddish purple color. Now over here on the right, this is an EMB plate. A quadrant streak was done on this plate. You can see they first did a streak here. Then they pulled through that section and did a streak here. Then they pulled through and did a streak here. And lo and behold, they got some colonies. Take a look at this growth. I think it's pretty obvious, right? This is what I mean by green metallic sheen. You can't even really see the purple color on these colonies because the green is so apparent. This green metallic color is characteristic of E. coli. So if you had the plate in your hand, you would be able to tell that the growth is purple, but it has this green sheen to it in the light. That's an E. coli growing. Now, take a look at this plate. This plate's been divided into sections. Right here, just one big blob of, of cells are growing and they've got that green color. That's E. coli. Over here, I've just got a big old blob of cells growing. Notice that there's a purple color to those cells, to this growth. That purple color tells us something. It tells us that this is a coliform. It can ferment, it can ferment lactose and or sucrose, but it's not E. coli. And down here, do you see this? This is a streak of growth that is not purple. That tells us that this is a gram negative fecal organism that cannot ferment lactose and sucrose. So this might be salmonella, this might be shigella or some other non coliform. And finally, we have this quadrant with nothing growing in it. If you put a streak on here and nothing grew, that would tell you you're likely got dealing with a gram positive organism. Gram positive organisms cannot grow on EMB. So you get a lot of information from EMB. If it grows on EMB, it has to be gram negative and it has to be a fecal enteric kind of organism. If you see growth, it, it has to be. Then you have to look at the color of the growth. If it's purple, it's a fermenter, it's a coliform. If it's purple and green, it's specifically E. coli. If it's sort of a clear color, you know it's a non-fermenter, it's not a coliform. So you get a lot of information. Here's another EMB plate, just so you can see a couple of different ones. Notice on this plate, the green sheen is only really visible where the streaks were the heaviest. This is another quadrant streak plate. Remember in the first quadrant, there's gonna be lots of growth. In the second quadrant, there's gonna be less growth. In the third, there'll be even less. And in the fourth, there'll be even less. And the purpose of the quadrant streak plate is to get isolated colonies. And they were successful with that. They got some colonies here. And you can see that these colonies are purple. Can you see it? They're purple. 
I know then that this is a gram negative fecal organism that's also a coliform. It can ferment the lactose and or the sucrose that's in the media. Notice that part of the media though, on part of this growth, I can also get that green sheen. So that tells me that this is E. coli. If there was no green here, all I would know is that I have a coliform, some coliform growing. And just for completeness sake, this is what a fisheye colony looks like. And you see those black dots in the middle of those colonies? Some strains, some strains of bacteria, when they grow on EMB, they'll, they'll grow as colonies with these black dots in the middle. Again, it doesn't help us identify them. It just um, is a, a feature that some bacterial strains have. All right, quick question for you. I told you at the beginning that we were gonna use mannitol salt, we were gonna use EMB, and we're also just gonna use nutrient agar. I told you I was gonna streak each organism onto the nutrient agar. Now, why would I do that? Why would I do that in the lab? Why not just go ahead, take my unknown culture, my mystery culture, put it on MSA, put it on EMB, and skip that step? What would be the purpose of taking each of the four possible organisms and putting them on nutrient agar? separate before I did anything else. Can anybody think of why, why you might do that? Nutrient agar is a basal media. Why would I take my precious time in the laboratory and knowing I have four possible organisms here, take the time to streak them out on nutrient agar before I did the rest of my experiment? Any idea? Lisa is suggesting it might give you some information about fastidious and non-fastidious. Yeah, absolutely, Lisa. I'll give you another piece of information. I happen to know that all four of these organisms are non-fastidious. Hmm, what would that purpose be? Why would I do that? Why would I streak all, the, all four of these out on nutrient agar first? before I took my mystery culture and I put it onto MSA and EMB. I grew a tube of E. coli. I grew a tube of Enterococcus. I grew a tube of Staph aureus and I grew a tube of Staph epidermidis. Lisa's uh, also suggesting uh, is that maybe I just want to grow more of them. That's a good, that's a good guess too, Lisa. Well, let's say that um, when I pull my broth tubes out of the incubator, I have very cloudy broth tubes. I would still want to put them on nutrient agar. So I, I grew four cultures. I took them out of the incubator, broth cultures. They were nice and cloudy. All four tubes were nice and cloudy. Why not just go ahead, take my mystery culture, put it on MSA, put it on EMB. Why make that extra step? Why take each of the possible organisms and grow them on a nutrient agar? Oh, you guys are coming up with great, great guesses. Sarah's suggesting maybe to see how many cells I have in each tube. That's a good guess too. The reason I would put those four cultures on nutrient agar first is because I need to make sure that all four of those organisms are alive and well. I need to make sure that in that cloudy broth tube, I have living, growing E. coli in tube one, living, growing Enterococcus in tube two, 
living, growing enterococcus, uh, sorry, staph epidermidis in tube three and living, growing staph aureus in tube four. In other words, when you take a broth tube out of the incubator and it's cloudy, you definitely have cells in there, but you don't know whether those cells are alive and growing. You just know you have them in there. That's why the broth is cloudy. Here's, here's why you have to do that extra step. Selective and differential media by its nature prevents certain things from growing, right? It prevents certain things from growing. So in order for me to interpret data from selective and differential media plates, I first have to prove that all of my cultures were healthy and growing because the lack of growth on a plate can then be the fact that, oh, well, that particular media doesn't allow certain organisms to grow. You see what I'm saying? If I took that E. coli tube out of the incubator and it was cloudy, but it turned out all the E. coli had died overnight, when I spread that E. coli on my EMB plate and I don't get any growth, it's not because it wasn't E. coli, it was E. coli. It was because the E. coli was dead. You see what I'm saying? The reason we use a nutrient auger type of media whenever we're doing a selective and differential experiment is because we have to first prove that all the cells are growing and healthy. It's a control, it's a check, it's a control mechanism. We're gonna run that control so that we know that right at the start of our experiment, all of our cultures were alive and growing. I'm then gonna choose two of them and put them into my mystery tube and we're gonna go forward. But I first have to show that my cultures are alive and growing. That's a control, that's a control step. All right. So here's the procedure. I took my NA plate, my nutrient auger plate. I actually drew four quadrants on the bottom of the plate. And then using my very best aseptic technique, I made a simple streak pattern in each quadrant with each of those four pure cultures. I, I can just do a quick streak, a quick zigzag streak, because all I need to show is that those four cultures are alive and growing. I need to put one organism in each quadrant and just a quick streak. I don't need colonies. I'm not trying to determine colony morphology. I don't need to make a spread plate. I'm not trying to count cells in an original culture. Remember, all I'm trying to do here is prove that the cultures are alive and growing. So I streaked the E. coli in one quadrant, the enterococcus in the second one, the S. epidermidis in the third one, the S. aureus in the fourth one. I put the plate upside down in the incubator for 24 hours and I looked. Here's two nutrient auger plates. These were actually made by students in the lab back when we were meeting in person. Take a look. Four quadrants. You can see this student made four streaks, one with each organism. And I got, we got four nicely growing cultures here. Same thing over here. All four of the cultures grew just fine on nutrient auger. So that told us that at the start of the experiment, all four cultures were very healthy and growing. Hey, notice something here. Look at this, this student nicely labeled their plate so they knew what was growing in which quadrant. Look over here, no labels. Uh-oh, the student would be hard pressed to know what was what here. And then what I did secretly was I took two of the organisms and I made an unknown mixed culture. Now, 
using that unknown mixed culture, I made a quadrant streak on MSA and I made a quadrant streak on EMB. I put both plates upside down into the incubator and now we can examine the results. So two of those four organisms are in our mystery culture. I com combined them into one tube. I did a quadrant streak on MSA. I did a quadrant streak on EMB. Our job is to figure out which two, which two organisms are growing or not growing. We'll see. Here's our first plate. Here's the MSA plate. Now, it's a little hard to see, but this was quadrant one. So we took a nice big streak of the culture, the mystery culture, and put it right here. Then I heated up my inoculating loop. I dragged through that first streak and I made a second one. Flay my loop, dragged through that, made a third, dragged through that, made a fourth. You can see there's, there's nothing growing in the, the third or the fourth one. I got colonies in the second one. All right, so I can tell you, cause it is a little hard to see. I have one type of colony growing here. One organism grew on this plate and it turned the media yellow. Remember, there are two, two bacteria in my mystery culture. Only one of them grew. The other one didn't grow. I only have one, one organism growing on MSA. And it turned the media yellow. That's interesting. What have I got? Do you know? Do we know yet what one of the organisms is? Can we tell? It's growing on MSA. That tells us something. And it turned the media yellow. What do you think? Lisa's got it. Sarah's got it. Candy's, Candy's sort of got it. You've got a mix of terms there, Candy. There you go. Yeah, it's Staphylococcus aureus. Remember, MSA selects for Staphylococcus. If it grows on MSA, it's a Staph. It also differentiates mannitol fermenters from non-fermenters. Staph aureus is a mannitol fermenter. Staph epidermidis is not. So the fact that we got one thing growing and it turned the media yellow, that tells us it has to be Staph aureus. But we don't know what the second organism is. It didn't grow on MSA. It didn't grow the second one. Could the second organism be Staph epidermidis? Could the second organism in our mystery culture be Staph epidermidis? Remember, we knew at the beginning that our cultures were alive and growing, nice and healthy. So could the second organism in the mystery culture be Staph epidermidis? Why or why not? you think? If staph epidermis were growing on that plate, what would it look like? What would it look like? Brooks got it. Amy's got it. Candy, Lisa, right. It can't, the second organism can't be staph epidermidis because if it was, I would also see some colonies growing on that plate that were sitting on pink media, not yellow media. 
if both of the organisms in there were staph, they would both grow on that plate. One of them would be growing on top of yellow media, and one of them would be growing on top of pink media. All of those colonies are growing on top of yellow media. So it can't be, the second, the second organism can't be staph epidermidis. It wouldn't make sense. If it were, if it were, what I would see on that plate were a bunch of colonies. Some colonies would be growing on yellow media and some would be growing on pink media. The staph aureus would have turned the media yellow and the staph epidermidis would have left it pink. I don't see that. All of the growth on that plate has turned the media yellow. Let's look again. There are no colonies on this plate that have left the media pink. They've all turned it yellow. So no, my second bug cannot be Staph epidermis. It just can't be. It's gotta be one of the others. Oh, check this plate out. Here's our EMB plate. It had 24 hours in the incubator. Here it is. There is absolutely nothing growing on that plate. Nothing, not even one colony growing on that plate. So here's our results. I took my mystery culture, my two organisms, and I spread them out on MSA, quadrant streak, and I spread them out on EMB. So I had two organisms that I spread onto this plate, but only one of them grew. I had two organisms that I spread on this plate and neither of them grew. This is the point where you have to kind of work through bug by bug, bacteria by bacteria, and check off whether or not you think they're in the culture. And that's what I've done here for us. I've summarized it here for us. Could E. coli be one of our two unknown organisms in our mixed culture? Remember, one of our organisms didn't grow on MSA. E. coli would not grow on MSA, would it? If E. coli was one of my mystery bugs, I wouldn't expect it to grow on MSA because MSA selects for Staphylococcus. One of my bugs did not grow on the MSA plate. So maybe it was E. coli, maybe. But if it was E. coli, it should have grown on EMB. It should have grown really well on EMB. And it should have grown as a purple organism, purple colony that turned green. I got nothing on my EMB. I have some information now, don't I? E. coli could not be in my mystery culture. How about Enterococcus faecalis? Enterococcus faecalis cannot grow on MSA because again, only Staphylococcus grows on MSA. So hey, check mark for that, right? Maybe Enterococcus faecalis was in my mystery tube and it didn't grow. That would make sense. But should Enterococcus faecalis grow on EMB? Should Enterococcus faecalis grow on EMB? What grows on EMB? What does EMB select for? Gram negative fecal organisms. Enterococcus faecalis is a fecal organism, but it's gram positive. It would have been inhibited from growing on EMB. What do you think? Could one of our mystery organisms be Enterococcus? <clears throat> if it was, 
It should not have grown on MSA and it should not have grown on EMB. Hmm, double check mark there, right? Yeah, Brooke saying, yeah. Sarah saying, yeah, yeah, it could have been. If I spread enterococcus on MSA, it's not gonna grow. If I spread enterococcus on EMB, it's not gonna grow. It could be, right? It could be enterococcus. How about staph epidermidis? Staph epidermidis should grow well on MSA and the media should stay pink. I didn't see that. I didn't see any growth on this, on this plate that left the media pink. So staph epidermidis cannot be one of my unknown organisms. And in addition, I would not expect staph epidermidis to grow on EMB because it's a gram positive organism. Could S. aureus be one of our bugs? Well, yeah, we've already said that, right? We know it grows on this media and we know it turns the media yellow. Check, check. And it should not grow on this media. It didn't, check. So now I go through my list of four and I look for the double check marks. One of the double check marks is for S. aureus. And one of the double check marks is for Enterococcus. Enterococcus faecalis was that second organism. It's a mystery, it's a game. It's a game when you start using selective and differential media. When you don't know what organism you're dealing with or what mixture of organisms you're dealing with. And you use selective and differential media, whether or not the thing grows is important and also whether or not it turns the media a color or the colonies grow as a color. All of that is important information for you. We usually use multiple kinds of selective and differential media when we're doing these tests because we can get more information that way. We can get more information by knowing that something grew on this plate but didn't grow on this plate. Or it grew here, but it didn't turn the media a certain color. You have to be able to go through and evaluate all that data in, and figure out what you have and what you don't have. That EMB plate told us we do not have E. coli. That EMB plate told us it couldn't be E. coli because if it was, we would see purple colonies with green color on them. So with selective and differential media, sometimes the data that we're getting is negative data. Sometimes the data is no growth, but that's helpful to us because we know what can and can't grow. And it gives us more information, more pieces to the puzzle. Now, our experiment was a little bit artificial only because we knew the possibilities. We knew what four organisms we started with and we knew some, uh, some of their traits. We knew which ones were gram negative and which were gram positive. So we had a lot of information to start with. We knew it had to be two of these. And of course, in the lab, you're not always gonna have that. EMB is a selective and differential media. The only things that are gonna grow on EMB are gram negative fecal organisms. It's gonna help us differentiate between E. coli, between other coliforms and between other non-coliforms, all by the color of what's growing. Gram-positive things can't grow on EMB. 
even gram positive organisms that live in the intestine, they cannot grow on EMB. And remember, it's the color that you see of the growth that tells you whether you have E. coli, whether you have other coliforms, or whether you have other non-coliforms, all based on the color of what's growing. It's very helpful to us. Does anybody have any questions about how we interpreted that? Any questions about why we knew that it, our mystery tube couldn't have E. coli in it? Why we knew that it couldn't have Staph epidermidis in it? We knew because of what was missing. If you know where something should grow and you don't see growth, you know it's not it. If we know something should be a certain color and it's not a certain color, then you know what you don't have. So these selective and differential media are very helpful to us in the lab, especially if we have an idea at the outset of what we're dealing with. Yes, we can always pull a basal media out and grow things on it. We can grow everything on that just about. And if we think we have a fastidious organism, we can pull out an enriched media, a complex media. But there are times where we don't want to deal with that. We want to go right in and find out. If I'm a physician and I see a patient in the, uh, in the ER or in the doctor's office, and I'm pretty sure that they've got a staph infection, I don't want to send that sample to the lab and have them grow it on nutrient agar because nutrient agar tells you nothing. It just tells you that a bacteria is growing. If I think it's a staph, I'm gonna want you to put it on MSA. I'm gonna want you to grow it on MSA because I'm gonna get some information from that. I'm gonna know whether I'm dealing with staph aureus. Now I'm gonna want some other tests done too, right? I'm gonna want some confirming tests done. I'm gonna to wanna to know, is this a pathogenic staph aureus? I'm gonna to wanna to know some other things. So I wouldn't stop by just growing it on MSA, but it, that's gonna give me some important information, especially since I know that multiple types of staphylococcus can grow on human skin. But if I've got a patient here with cellulitis or I've got a patient with a big abscess or some other bad skin infection, there's no need, there's no need for the lab to put that onto something like EMB. EMB is when, I'm th when I think I'm working with an intestinal organism. I'm clearly working with a skin organism in that patient and knowing what kinds of things grow on human skin comes in helpful at that point. And in the lab, we can help. We can help narrow down the possibilities by using these selective and differential media. Amy's asking a great question. When the labs are ordered, does the provider write this down? What the provider will write down, Amy, is that they suspect it's a staphylococcus. And then they leave the rest to the lab. They suspect it's a staphylococcus. The other thing they'll say sometimes is, in my experience, is they'll say, um, ruling, we're trying to rule out staph aureus. In other words, we're concerned it might be a staph aureus. If you could help us figure that out, that would be great. <laughs> so no, they don't tell us what tests to run, but they do tell us what organism they think they're working with. And that guides which tests will then be run in the laboratory. That's a great question. Yeah, so you can see that as a physician, they have to have an idea in their head of what they're dealing with. 
Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. And, um, and they'll let us know. Let's say, for example, they see some kind of an infection on the skin that looks very bizarre. It doesn't look like anything they've ever seen. Maybe it's growing strangely. Maybe it's created some kind of ulcer that they've never seen. They'll let us know in the lab. They'll let us know that this doesn't look like a staph. And again, we're gonna have to run multiple tests to identify that organism. But any information that we can get from the physician is extremely helpful because it helps guide our decisions as to what tests should be run. Great questions. All right. So that's the end of the slide set. If there are no other questions, remember that on Wednesday, we're gonna be talking about oxygen and growth. We're gonna talk about how we manage growing different microbes in the lab that have different requirements for oxygen. Remember, some microbes are just like us. Some microbes need oxygen in order to make their ATP, but there are lots of other microbes that don't. And we need different ways to grow organisms that have different requirements for oxygen. And we're gonna see that by looking at how microbes grow in certain media, we can get an idea of whether or not they use oxygen, whether or not they can use oxygen, but don't have to, and whether or not oxygen is toxic to them. We can get a lot of information by looking at how they grow in certain types of media. But that will be on Wednesday. <laughs> All right, everybody, um, I'm going to let you go, set you to work, enjoy the rest of the day, and I will see you on Wednesday morning. All right, have a great day. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next time. <laughs>